Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. Today's podcast is sponsored by Austin Private Wealth, a registered investment advisor focused on fee-only financial planning and investment management. Their mission is to serve affluent clients with personalized financial advice, fostering a trusted relationship that will endure for generations to come. Austin Private Wealth is not just about managing wealth. They're about inspiring you to embrace a future filled with possibilities and helping you architect enduring legacies. Their core values of integrity, service, caring, excellence, and growth are at the heart of everything they do. Connect with them today at austinprivatewealth.com. Austin Private Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Austin Private Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Austin Private Wealth unless a client service agreement is in place. Investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. David Neff is an operating partner at Ecliptic Capital where he works with portfolio companies on people, processes, marketing, strategy, and culture. He spearheads the fund's concentration on climate change and energy transition as part of the Ecliptic Capital's deep tech thesis. David's career was built in the early days of the dot-com era, where he led the digital product development, marketing, and strategy for the American Cancer Society. Mr. Neff then founded and ran his own digital consulting firm, and over the past 12 years, his strategy and product clients included Hulu, Verizon, Dell, Lowe's Hardware, Southwest Airlines, Pepsi, Lululemon, Office Depot, Bill.com, Wolverine Worldwide, and Discover Card. His international experience includes such clients as Tesco, Sky TV, and Kingfisher. David's a previous winner of the American Marketing Association's Marketer of the Year Award, and past winner of the Austin Monthly People Under 30 to Know and the Austin Under 40 Awards for Up-and-Coming Professionals. He currently serves on the board for the Moody College of Communications at the University of Texas and the board of directors for the Multicultural Refugee Center. David, welcome to the Austin Next Podcast. Thank you. Big fan and a big fan of what you and, and Jason are doing in our community. Thanks, sir. appreciate it. I wanted to talk about Ecliptic Capital and where you guys are today in terms of climate investing. You have a deep tech thesis to begin with, and you approach climate and environmental investing as a unique ecology, and that's great. Um, you talk about three different areas, adaptation, building and electrification, and then climate-friendly materials. And I need you to define these, those three because they can mean anything to anybody practically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, adaptation, the first one you mentioned, we're thinking a lot about. I feel uh, uh, with the Paris Accords, everything that's come after that, but then also just individual countries, people being people, politics being politics. There's obviously a huge risk that we're going to blow past 1.5 to 2 degrees maybe 2.5, things start to get bad, as, as you know, from your background and for the folks listening, right? And I'm talking about uh, the warming of the temperature of the planet. And so for us, we're starting to look at, if that doesn't happen, how are people thinking about adaptation? We're thinking a lot about AI and adaptation, right? So in my world, that could mean, gosh, we have all of these satellites in orbit that we use for thousands of different reasons, but they're taking photos constantly of the surface, right? How could a company develop AI to take those photos and understand over time on top of what the NSF is doing or NOAA or other worldwide organizations thinking about our atmosphere, ocean currents, you know, places where tides are getting higher, faster. Um, and what could we use that data for, right? Obviously, we should not build here. This is not a safe place for people to live anymore. Who would buy that data? Developers, insurance companies, you can imagine, right? Local city utilities, governments, all sorts of different folks. 
So I think there's a whole area of adaptation powered by AI that we're looking at, understanding the changing environment and how quickly it's changing, which I think is surprising to a lot of us and then even surprising to the scientists who talk about it a lot. So that's one area, one kind of example of that, right? You know, second area for us too, and I, I have some examples here, you know, for us, built environment, building creation, the greenest building is the building that's already built. If you go down a level from that, how are you building, uh, how are you electrifying buildings, right? We often hear of the solution in a lot of climate circles and environmental circles and, it, you know, electrify everything. Great. That's easy for all of us to say. And that's, that's an easy headline to get from, gosh, we're outlawing gas powered stoves, just all the hype you see everywhere, right? But what that means is we actually, Michael, as you know, need the infrastructure to do that. And although we're not getting into heavy industrial, institutional, you know, billions of dollars of infrastructure plays as a venture capital firm, we are thinking a lot about charging. We have a great company now we've put a good amount of money into called Veloce Energy. Veloce has kind of a very innovative hardware and software, EV charging and battery storage, right? They're able to get closer to buildings from a fire safety hazard. So you can put more in, charge more cars. They're able to do a lot of things above ground. So you don't need to trench. You don't need to get long, complicated permits to trench the land because you're able to do it above ground. And they're also through that use of hardware, software, and battery, able to do level three charging on level two wires, right? So very innovative, very interesting company. Um, and things like that are part of this bigger giant discussion of electrify everything and our, our built environments. And then I think, you know, we want to look at green concrete, right? What's the better version of concrete that could be used in buildings? There's a lot of experimental stuff going on right now with timber and making renewable timber actually as strong of a building material as concrete and maybe some forms of steel, right? Again, very experimental, but it's being tried. You know, you see a lot of small scale under experiments in that as well. And then, you know, the third thing, climate friendly materials is probably our broadest topic, but we've put a lot of money into material science people who are doing climate work. And a lot of our climate people are material science people, right? We have uh, two companies. One's called Nanotech. They've kind of invented this revolutionary, disruptive, fireproofing nanoparticle, right? You're able to put 3,000 degrees of heat on it for hours, and it does not burn. It does not catch fire. What's the first application for that? Roofing, right? They're out right now putting that on commercial retail roofs. and the hypothesis is obviously better heating and cooling because it's better insulation. And the insulation layer is a millimeter thick instead of our normal insulation layers that we think about in green buildings. Inches or feet thick, yeah. That's right. Uh, another one that's out of Texas State in San Marcos is NABCO. We can talk about that one later too. I don't want to go too long on the first answer here. But there's so many interesting things. There's even a company we're looking at called TomTex that's using chitin. Chitin is what the shells of crabs are made out of. It's in the walls of fungi as well. And they're saying, this is actually a revolutionary, strong, biodegradable material. We could probably use this in belts and clothing and shoes. Could replace a lot of this polyurethane and plastic that we're using and all the things I just described, right? So I feel the material science aspect of climate is a little bit overlooked. And so although software much easier, uh, as you and I talked about, we're kind of zagging, maybe when other people are zigging towards that material science thesis. Yeah, one of the companies that I started that did not end well uh, was in this space where we were working with technology that would dramatically improve the strength of plywoods with a very thin material in between. I don't think it was that fire resistant. 3,000 degrees for an hour. <laughs> is going to buzz through you know, any regulatory environment. But, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about with regard to these materials, I'm not an expert in this area. But as I understand it, if you want a fire door, the building codes are X thick, Y type material, you know, and, and then they get around to, oh yeah, and you could put a few hundred degrees to it 
for 15 minutes before it burns. What happens if I take this, this nano coating and take it and apply it to a regular door, you know, or a thin door like I have between rooms in my home, and I really have this great fire protection, but it doesn't come close to code. How do you guys address that kind of, of problem? Yeah, and, and you nailed it, right? And that the length of time to test it, to get regulatory approvals for, gosh, those building codes to change on a city-by-city, city, state-by-state basis would put companies out of business, right? So that's something that's very interesting on the long-term roadmap, right? And, and I know the founder would love to come and tell you and, and have a lot more to say about it than, than I do. But that's also why we're like, okay, you know what? First step is roofing, right? Let's get it hail tested. Let's get it approved. Let's run the hypothesis that this is going to obviously be able to reduce heating and cooling needed inside the building to a significant degree, especially in large commercial retail spaces. But yes, everything you said is absolutely true. And I think it's a good point. It's like you can start a great material science company, but if you pick the wrong hypothesis for your first market or your second market, it can put you right out of business. So it's a, a very complicated and delicate hypothesis to run over time. Absolutely. Now, I don't want to get too far away from the banco. You know, I've adopted Texas as my hometown. Love avocados. Got to have the guacamole for my Tex-Mex food. Tell me a little bit about the company and how that enables food to stay fresh longer and therefore be useful longer. Yeah, so this technology spun out of Texas State. It's a uh, self-assembling clay-based nanoparticle. And again, one of the things we look at at Ecliptic Capital is market adjacencies, right? Let's start with food, but could you use this on other materials to coat them in a, a cleaner, safer way? Yes, right? But let's start with a target market. They hired a fantastic CEO from Green Giant, who obviously gets food, gets agriculture, understands the market, understands who the growers are, the buyers are. And so the self-assembling clay nanoparticle gets applied to fruit. The first kind of test market is pears. Um, pears similar to avocados, although not as bad. Avocados are our main offender here in that they go black in like several days after you buy them. I, I hear you. Pears get that scruffy, beat up look, right? And basically, this clay nanoparticle is able to coat them. Uh, and what causes that and what causes that avocado to rot, obviously, over time is oxygen, right? Oxygen and moisture getting in from the outside. So the self-assembling clay nanoparticle, if you look at it under a microscope and in a lot of the stuff that they've been doing, it almost looks like a maze from when you were a kid, right? Where you draw the line through it, right? So it's self-assembling into this barrier that makes it almost impossible for things to penetrate, but it's also clay. It's a mineral. It's totally organic. Uh, the alternatives in that space are wax. Wax is generally made from petrochemicals. Not the best thing for all of us to be eating. So everybody listening and to this podcast, please continue to wash your fruit when you buy it, right? And, you know, there's other people in the market that are doing interesting things as well, too. But it's also kind of that market, right? That market, one of the big competitors went for grocery stores. We're going to have the grocery stores tell the growers, tell the suppliers that they need to use our product. That doesn't go over well, maybe with growers and suppliers, right? Growers and suppliers say, hey, grocery store, we're going to listen to you because you're obviously a, a, a retailer and you buy our product. But why don't you let us do what we know best, which is cleaning, coating, and understanding the fruit. And so this company, Nabco, uh, Neutral Wrap is the product, uh, has been smart to go and talk to the growers, go and talk to the actual people producing the fruit, and doing tests. And saying, look, we're going to test pears, how much longer they're shelf stable. We're going to test cherries, how much longer are they shelf stable. Fruit after fruit after fruit. Uh, you know, I have not looked, but I'm sure avocado is, is on that list somewhere as well, too. Obviously, there's a ton of people growing those. There's a ton of people buying those. They do need to be more shelf safe. And for us, this is also a great climate play because what does rotting fruit do? Most of us do not compost. 
I'm sure you do. I do. Maybe a lot of people listening to this podcast hopefully do. If not, you should, especially if you live in the city of Austin. They have a great composting program, depending on where you live. But that ends up in a landfill. And then it rots. And then it releases methane. And methane being kind of one of our second worst um, uh, gases released in the greenhouse gases categories, right? So less fruit ending up as methane in the atmosphere as it rots is a huge problem, a lot huger than people think it is. And that's how we kind of frame this as a, a climate solution. We've talked about two materials. They both come out of university research. How do you guys find that invention, that disclosure from some PhD candidate or professor, whether it's San Marcos or, you know, or Texas State or UT Austin or da what? How do you guys find those? You know, it's interesting, right? Nanotech, the fireproofing company out of Houston, a Rice graduate who's doing the work along with a very talented technical team. And we actually found them out of Halliburton Labs, right? So an accelerator program, not a university. But yeah, Texas State, we actually found it after it was out of uh, Texas State or just being gestated, right? So we've been very lucky to have people find us. What we're doing now, now that we've finished raising fund one and we've deployed a lot of that capital into, you know, we don't just do climate, we do cybersecurity and we do medical uh, tech as well, as I'm, I'm sure you've heard from other folks you've talked to. But for all three of those categories that we invest in, we are now proactively picking our heads up and going out to universities, starting with University of Texas, obviously Dell Medical School is a great place to talk about med tech and medical inventions. You know, Texas A&M has a newly launched school of innovation. Texas A&M has actually taken their commercialization group and taken it out of an individual university and put it at the system level, um, which I think is very smart to look over all, everything going on in the Texas A&M system. We're figuring out what does that look like at the University of Houston? What does that look like at Rice, right? Obviously, Rice has the business plan and Rice is, is a clean tech accelerator. Rice is obviously already headed in that direction under strong leadership. I think a lot of colleges are catching up. A lot of colleges maybe historically had a dean or a president who was just like, that's interesting. But, you know, like if, if a company starts here, great, we're going to get a royalty fee and we call it a day, right? And, and you've, I'm sure, experienced this and talked to these people. And then the newer colleges and the newer people are thinking about it differently, right? We're going to have our own accelerator. We're not going to take a royalty. We're going to maybe take a percentage. Maybe we're writing them a check. Maybe we're not. Of course, you still have situations where a graduate student's doing something super interesting and a principal investigator might say like, Actually, you had that idea under my watch. So I want in. I want a part of it, right? And we're kind of just uncovering all this right now, Michael. I feel, you know, I've written a couple books and I feel there's maybe half a book on technology commercialization at universities with really interesting case studies. But, you know, I don't know when I'm going to write that one. Let's go ahead and, and steal the thunder for that book right now. <laughs> if you were to sit down, whether it's the president, you know, of UT Austin here, Jay Herzl, of Rice or whatever. And you were to say, here are my three things that I want you to do to make it easier for me and other people to take your technology and commercialize it. What would those three things be? Yeah, great question. Number one, I would show up and say, hey, unlike most venture capitalists, accelerators, maybe angels, we want to be part of the university. What can we do for you? This is not a one way. This is a two way, right? Do you need us to come talk to students? Do you need to come help us be part of classes? Do you need us to judge? Do you need us to do picture views? Do you need us to look at technology abstracts and give you an idea on it, right? And most universities kind of look at us strangely. They're like, but you didn't go to school here. And we're like, we totally, but if you want help from our particular version of what we do in our world and the world of finance and venture capital, we would like to help. So that's number one is what are we offering them? It's a two-way street, right? Number two, to me, I would say uh, you need to have people who think about commercial technology and commercialization of technology that is not a department of 30 lawyers. <laughs> uh, sorry. And, uh, sorry. And, and I, uh, sorry, not sorry, as the kids say nowadays. And, you know, for me, 
I would say we're happy to talk to them. We totally get it. Your IP, it's created here. You want your royalty. But you also need people who think about commercial technology and commercialization of that technology. People who are actively talking to, I don't know, Microsoft or Amazon and connecting them with students who have interesting AI ideas or hardware ideas or whatever that flow of information is. It can't just be like, we're going to commercialize your technology by taking a royalty and good luck. So I would say there needs to be almost partnership people, uh, uh, you know, from a software mindset, which is my background is software. It's like, I need a good partnership person out in the ecosystem, finding and connecting people. And then the, the third thing I would say to you is just understand, especially for some of these harder plays in material science and your geoscience department or your engineering department or, you know, your chemistry department, you can't have a royalty or a fee on day one. You're going to put that company out of business. It's not Shark Tank um, where Mr. Wonderful wants a $3 royalty on every widget that this person sells, right? And that's bad, by the way, to begin with, as you know, but even worse if a university is taxing you from day one. So I would want the universities to think about how hard it is to launch a business and be like, you know what, in year five, once you hit these milestones, we'll start collecting our royalty or you know, maybe don't have a royalty and figure out another way to kind of monetize that. Or maybe just be super excited that your students are out there doing very interesting things, right? Those would be kind of three off the cuff I have. There you go. Hopefully with uh, some of the things that are going on at, at uh, UT and with uh, President Harsel coming out of the business school, he's a finance guy. He might understand this more than others do. I think he does. And people have told us he does. Right. And, you know, if he's listening to this podcast, we'd obviously love to <laughs> we'd love to have a conversation with him. Yeah, I'd love to broker that. That'd be great. A lot of fun. One of the other technologies I hear a lot about is carbon capture. Yeah. And I know you guys are, are I don't know if you've invested in carbon capture or you're still, you're still looking at him, I hope. You know, are we there yet? Yeah, I I uh, it's interesting. I'm very torn on the subject. and. You know, when I was publishing our, our climate thesis, which anybody can kind of go read on our, our LinkedIn and our Medium and soon to be on kind of a new website that we're working on, we save it for last and we're maybe a little bullish on it, but maybe we're a little wishy-washy on it. And I, I feel there's a lot to unpack there, right? I would say the main points is right now the UN is kind of pre-releasing and working on a study, which I think is going to come out in a couple of weeks, maybe when COP28 comes out um, or later on this year, that is like, we're also, the science behind it is sound. I mean, it works, we understand it, but we think long-term it's not the best play. And that's people way smarter than I um, uh, thinking about it, understanding the technology and reporting on it, right? And so I, I think it's necessary. I think it will happen. But, you know, we traditionally think of a lot of this carbon collection as being a little bit of a PR move right now, right? The carbon credits, the market that's driving these factories and machines to be built is a little smoke and mirrors. It's wild, wild west right now. And I, I think there's people out there who would argue with me on that all day. And there's people out there who would be on my side on that comment, right? And I get it, right? Chase bought $200 million dollars worth of carbon credits this week. The stuff going on at Frontier, Frontier's buying maybe over $100 million worth of carbon credits from Charm, which is doing you know a lot of um, biochar work to sequester carbon. That's awesome. That's great. I love Frontier. I love that collection of companies that have come together. But you know, Michael, at the end of that, it's like, it's like, well, great. They, they're buying $200 million worth of carbon credits from these people doing carbon sequestration and direct air capture or other things like that. But the demand's not there. They can't produce $200 million. That's like banking. $200 million might be the next 10 years of carbon sequestration. So it's kind of a PR move, right? Uh, but it's a good, it's a positive PR move, right? I, I think this is all heading in a positive direction, but I know we're not putting money down right now because we're worried about the market that's driving it. And then we're worried about, you know, building a $200 million Climeworks plant in Norway that's sequestering carbon for thousands of years 
uh, but how much is it doing per year? What's the environmental impact of building that factory, all that steel, all that cement? What's powering that factory, right? You can get into scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And so for me, I feel like, yes, it will be part of our long-term 2050 solution is to suck carbon out of the air and put it somewhere, right? But I feel like that is, we're just not sold on that right now. And, and also uh, governments, and people who have billions of dollars to spend, not millions of dollars to spend, will hopefully come in and do that. And I was part of a great climate school called Terra.do, and I'm a fellow from their climate school. And one of the things that just plays in my head every day, they said, it's like, look, big tech's not going to save us. Policy and finance, along with technology, along with people and individual decisions, are going to actually help us get to where we need to get by 2050, right? So that plays in my head a lot. And, and there's people a lot bigger than us uh, that could come in and really help shape those markets and help build that $200 million direct air capture carbon plant. Yeah, I get concerned every time COP happens. And a lot of it's because of Article 6 and everything that's going on there. It, it's interesting because we see a lot of things happening in the, in the carbon credit markets. You probably read Zimbabwe just seized and nationalized all the carbon credit projects in the country. I had not seen that. I have no idea what that's going to mean, but I'm glad we aren't in, in Zimbabwe. One of the things that always makes a difference to me in terms of people selling carbon credits are the ancillary benefits to the landowners. I want to know where the money's going. I want to know what's it doing because I've seen the math behind some of these carbon projects it's way the hell over my head. Either that or it's all fake. I'm not sure which. But I can go to where our project works and I know the impact. I see what's happened. So whether or not we're doing four tons a hectare or three tons a hectare or six tons a hectare, okay, we can argue about that. For example, in our, in, in our location, we're bringing in birthing kits because the area has the highest infant and child mortality rate on the planet. I can see that impact. You know, we're doing a deal with, with um, USAID to start electrifying this area that has no electricity, no running water. I can see that. And I know that beyond the carbon sequestration, there's good coming out of it. Enough about that. No, no, you're, you're 100% right. And, and I've seen a lot of interesting pitches on biodiversity credits and gosh, is that going to be the wild, wild west? Is that stacked on top of carbon credits? You're also getting a biodiversity credit. And then is that all PR ESG stuff that happens 10 years from now? And uh, I'm on the board of a great nonprofit, which I will shamelessly plug, called Multicultural Refugee Center. And we have a farm outside of Austin where we employ a lot of refugees and we grow vegetables and we sell vegetables. We're at all the farmers markets here in town, right? And just recently, we thought about regenerative agriculture for that farm, right? Just recently, we thought about a carbon plan for that farm, right? Could we work with the city of Austin, which, uh, you know, I know is kind of one of the questions about how Austin's involved in all this, and figure out what a good carbon plan would look like if we're doing the correct thing at the farm. And I am 100% with you. I'm not worried about our, are we getting one ton or half a ton collected per acre. We'll get there. Somebody will verify that and then we'll figure it out. But we're giving people jobs. We're treating the earth correctly. We're growing fruits and vegetables organically and we're selling them and making money. We're not just out getting grants or kind of these other mechanisms that nonprofits often rely on. So very, very proud to be a, a member there. It's a real project with real impact. That's right. And you can physically drive it and see it unlike the carbon credit machine at the airport that tries right. to sell you offsets for your flight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's get back to the VC model. And you and I talked about this real briefly before we got started. It's got to be hard as a venture capitalist to invest in a lot of these projects because they have timeframes well beyond a lot of the timeframes for projects like you normally see. How do you guys structure those so that your LPs are okay with it? that you guys feel you can manage it, you know, as, a, as advisors and board members, how does that work for Ecliptic? 
Yeah, you know, it's a it's a great question. It's obviously something we get asked a lot and we we think about a lot internally. And I I feel it's a hypothesis and we're testing that hypothesis in fund one and then we'll keep testing the AB version of that hypothesis in fund two and forward, right? Never maybe having a perfect answer. But we think a lot about patient capital solving capital P problems. So in a radically transparent way, we go out and we talk to our LPs about this particular portion of what we want to invest in, in material science and and climate and energy transition. That's going to take a lot longer than, say, the cybersecurity company we're also investing in. And so, yes, that cybersecurity company may get flipped uh, in a normal time frame or have a a fantastic outcome or or not, uh, right? Risk is always involved, as you and I both know. And what we're doing is hopefully placing our bets strategically so that we can support that material science company that needs to build an actual factory, right? They have a lab space, they get some big orders, they get some interesting contracts, and they're like, gosh, we actually need to build more of this product, and we're going to outgrow our lab space, and we can't ever make enough to fulfill our orders. That's a good thing. Okay, well, great. How are you doing project financing? Are we helping you with that? you know, the fundraising involved in in project financing and everything else. But those are all hypotheses that we're thinking about and playing on because we know our material science people will always take longer. We also know our med tech people will take a while to get to where they need to go. You've obviously had a lot of very smart med tech and folks on your show before. So you, you get that industry as well. And so it's like, gosh, our bets here are strategically placed, but know as you put money into the fund, We have some things that take a while, right? The beauty of that is there may be adjacent businesses that spin out of this material science company, and they actually have three huge markets marketing three different products. Each product is now its own business, and you'll have the opportunity to get involved in those businesses if they really take off into all these adjacent markets that we hope. Multiple bites of the apple, both on the investment in as well as the profits out. That's probably the way to have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about Austin a little bit. We talked a little bit about how Ecliptic looks at tech transfer, how you perceive it as a partnership. Talk to me about how you guys are involved in the rest of Austin's ecosystem. Yeah. Great. Great question. We have a little bit of a cheat code in that, and uh, a lot of the people involved have been institutions in the Austin scene. Worley, Mike Irwin, who was a CFO and one of the co-founders of Chaotic Moon, Chaotic Moon being a a, a very influential, gigantic agency here. Adam Lippman, who was the COO of Chaotic Moon. They obviously all sold that to Accenture. So people know them, they get it. Mike Millard, another one of our fantastic partners, was the CEO of Mass Challenge for the entire state of Texas, right? So the deal flow he saw, the people he met. A twice entrepreneur myself, I've had two exits. One was a company we sold to PwC. Another was a company we sold to Accenture. And so we have a little bit of a cheat code in that and just being here for a long time, knowing people, being in the scene, out of the scene, back in the scene, out of the scene, back into the scene. But you know, I believe in the long-term growth of, of Austin and us wanting to be more involved. I think right now we're being like great, Jawad Ali has a fantastic med tech uh, group that he's a part of, and obviously talks to Jason a lot about that too. So how do we start attending that? How do we sponsor something? How do we kind of be a part of that scene, right? We're just starting to be like, great. We had our heads down raising fund one and deploying capital. And now let's heads up before we start into fund two um, and get out there and be part of the Austin community. So Again, a little bit of a cheat code, but also it's going to be on us to go out and and be a part of it. And, you know, Michael, it was interesting because I came into the job and thought, I bet there are all of these climate material science companies here in Austin, right? Very naive. I've been in the job nine months and I've met under 20 people that are working or interested in climate in Austin. Like I have an email list, like an old school listserv. <laughs> and I'm like, hey guys, did you see this? And they all reply back. It's very 1990s, early 2000, right? But when you're talking about a small number of people. That's right. That's exactly what you need to do. Yeah. And so what am I doing? I'm going to Houston. 
right? Houston has Greentown Labs, Halliburton Labs, you know, Shell Game Changers, right? Studio X is here in town doing some interesting work in climate. 776, which is Alexis O'Hanahan's fund. 776 is here in town. So I'm talking to the person who runs that for them. But, you know, we still end up in Houston a lot because of energy transition and the amount of folks in Houston that are really thinking about renewables, energy transition, and climate tech. It's interesting that with UT here and with this history in, I'm going to call it exploiting nature and exploiting natural resources, that we don't have more folks in areas that we would call climate related. And, you know, reason I think that is, right, clean tech 1.0, Solar came out of that electrification. We kind of got it. Um, and now we've switched. We don't even use clean tech anymore. We say climate tech, right? Wider, broader, systemic approach to it than just, you know, EVs and solar panels. And I think Austin is still in this software mode, right? If you're going to be in Austin, you are a SaaS entrepreneur. And part of that is because we have great SaaS VCs here doing super interesting work that everybody knows. Part of it is our legacy of Austin Ventures from, you know, long before my time. But we have a lot of SaaS people. Now, I would hope people hear this and are like, oh, maybe Austin's a good place for my SaaS startup that's actually dealing with climate. And yes, please, I would love to talk to you. And I know a lot of people on my tiny listserv of people that are actually investors that would want to talk to you too. Um, I think we're just not getting there just yet, right? I think people just think of us as like, I've got a SaaS company or Web3 or whatever the heck it is. That's what you do in Austin. And we just don't have the infrastructure, right? We have the infrastructure for software companies in Austin. And again, my hope is people listen to this and people don't listen to this, but they start thinking about, gosh, we could do climate in Austin. That'd be interesting. Let me go talk to that David guy because he would love to spend his time with me and talk about it and develop it. And I, David would love to introduce me to other people who are interested in that. I just think we're just not there yet. Well, let's make it happen. We're going to get there. You and I, I mean, you're just as interested in the topic. So yeah, please. This has been a great conversation. We always kind of end this the same way. David Neff, what's next for Ecliptic Capital and what's next for Austin? Yeah, I think what's next for Ecliptic Capital is continuing a laser focus on really working with our founders, the people we've deployed capital to. You know, we didn't get to, to talk about this, but we really take this approach of meeting with them at least twice a month, if not more, and going through people, process, technology, culture, data, strategy, helping them in ways that operators can help other operators and people who have consulting backgrounds and agency backgrounds can come in and really solve problems, right? So I think we're continuing to do that. I think in fall of this year, we'll start talking about Fund 2 and, and raising for Fund 2 with very similar thesis. I think what's next for Austin is I, I hope people are thinking about climate and the climate crisis is one of the fundamental biggest problems of this generation and the next generation. And so I, I do think there's people in Austin who listen to this who are in a garage somewhere, you know, whatever that stereotype or trope is for entrepreneurs nowadays or a WeWork, whatever it is. And when they want to start their next thing, they're thinking about climate or they quit their job at Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Accenture. They quit that big tech job to go work on climate. And I, I hope I see a lot more of that in, in Austin. It would make me very, very happy. And our kids and our grandkids very happy that that's the problem you chose to work on. This is why we do it. David Neff, Clip to Capital. Thanks so much for joining me on Austin Next. Thank you for having me. So what's next, Austin? We're glad you've joined us on this journey. Please subscribe at your favorite podcast catcher. Leave us a review and let your colleagues know about us. This will help us grow the podcast and continue bringing you unique interviews and insights. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.